Uh, it's great to be uh, here this morning, and uh, this is uh, since I've been in the job the third time I've had the opportunity to talk at the uh, the Rural Press Club. And Ed, thank you for that. Um, it is a it is a, a great organisation and something that I know you lead and lead extremely well. To your partners, and there's lots of them. If you look at those sponsors up there, there's some of those that are actually iconic to Victoria and have been for many years. And we're just talking about um, Warnable, the Warnable Cheese and Butter Factory, of what that actually um, means to Warnable. Uh, and if you think of that as just one of those industries that are um, undergoing a fair bit of change and challenges, and no different, I suppose, if you were from Shepparton and talked about SPC, they are iconic um, companies, but it also shows what Victoria is in its sense of focus on community. I think that's, uh, that's something, if, you don't, uh, if you've never experienced that rural uh, country town, ownership of what is the underlying um, social, and it is social, and the economics is something that is very special to Victoria. And I think that goes on um, to even acknowledge what our volunteer services, not only our emergency services, but the broader group that work in emergency management, um, all do for us. And uh, we should never underestimate um, what that is, uh, what they give, uh, and if we ever lost it, I don't think we'd ever rebuild it, which is something we should uh, protect. And no doubt um, Mick Burke and those CEOs of agencies certainly do make sure that we protect uh, and grow what is being built by our fathers before us. Um, Today, I thought probably the best way was to cut this into a couple of things. One was to talk about the last few years, I'd say the last three years, but for some that come off the Royal Commission, it's probably five. Uh, a little bit about the next three years, and then a little bit about the season that we're about to face. Now, it's interesting when you look back three years. Um, I've been in this role uh, just over three years now, and uh, there's lots that have changed. And the mandate within the emergency services or the emergency management sector has been very strong that they want change. So the directors, the CEOs, the chiefs have all wanted change. And it's interesting when you talk to the people on the grassroots, they actually want change too. One of our challenges in any change is getting the middle managers, the middle group, to actually um, accept, understand and drive the change. And that's not criticism of our middle managers, we've got great middle managers, but they are actually the gatekeepers of many things we do. So our change program, the bottom wants change, the top's leading change, it's how we actually get the middle to accept and understand the changes um, that are needed and how in which they're put in place. And I'll show, um, as I go through my speech this morning, some examples of what that actually means to us. One thing we did do uh, three years ago, and it was the CEOs of the um, SES, MFB, uh, then DSE, or Dept Secretary of DSE, and SES, was to talk about refocusing what we are. And those that have heard me speak before, um, it's very simple. It's all about community. And we've got some very basic diagrams that reset the frame we are looking at that the community was front and centre of everything we did. And we've got this, um, it's almost like a, a dartboard, I suppose, that put the, the community well and truly in the centre. And I know we have tested ourselves and tested other programs to say, if it's not about the community, why are we even doing it? And I think it's been quite fundamental to actually reset the business, the focus. Now you might say that's strange for organisations that are there to protect communities, that we had to refocus it. There was an opinion um, from some, and the Royal Commission was one of those, uh, that we had become somewhat of an internalised or internalistic in the way in which we, we were operating. And uh, you, could you could see evidence, you could actually scratch the place and see that it was about the organisation and not about the outer, uh, outer bit and the partnership with communities. So, so that was something that, uh, that I think has been fundamental in the, in the three-year um, three journey. The second one in an operational sense, and the first year was, first year of my appointment was very much about setting some new direction in operations. And one of those uh, on, the, on the 1st of December 2010, which was the official day that I took up, I'd been there three months prior um, attempting to uh, get some idea and some clarity of what I was doing, or to do, was to set in place what we call the state control priorities. Now I won't go through them, but there are, there are uh, six priorities that talk about primacy of life, talk about issuing information to communities that's uh, useful th for them to use in a timely way. Uh, talks about protection of critical assets or community assets, residential property, economics in communities and environmental uh, assets and values. Now really easy for me to rattle them off. What, what I would say though, and others will test me here, is that has been hugely successful in the sense that people now talk it back to us. Now CFA, if you use CFA as a test bed, CFA is a huge organisation and any change in, the, in an organisation the size of CFA is a minimum of two years. By the time Mick thinks up a great idea and gets it out there and the person on the ground at Rapunyip or Bruthen 
or Malakuta actually um, probably resonates, understands it and does it, it's, it's a two-year journey as a minimum. We've seen that those control priorities not only in fire but flood, we wrote them in a way that wasn't about fire, we wrote them in a more generic way, are now being uh, quoted back to us. So interesting enough, 18 months on, uh, we were very strong on it, uh, that these control priorities reset the way in which we operated and operated together, was a fundamental about change and people took to it. Now, if you stop and think about that, that's a bit of a test about change. If they had rejected that and said, no, no, we don't want this new, new method of operation, um, we want to stay where, we, where we've been in 2008, 2007, 1987, 1977, we would have had a fundamental issue of what our workforce, the people we work with and for, um, could cope with. To me, that was only one example, a bit of a litmus test about the level of change and the desire to pick up new ideas and strong leadership from all of us in, in leadership positions to take forward and um, champion to an outcome. Likewise, in a control sense, in an operational sense, we put in something called the line of control, which clarified the single way of operating for all of us. Really important, again, it took a little bit of work to do because we we're really challenging those principles of how some agencies had operated for decades. And in many of the agencies, the churn, the turnover of people is not huge. So someone that's been there 30 years has been there every day of the 30 years, um, which means they've got some very strong, um, understood principles they work, work with and work for. And we were challenging those. So the line of control, which I won't go into into detail, but it is about how we um, deal at incident, region and state level, and make sure it's clar clar uh, very clear, it's, so it's, uh, it's got clarity to it, and it has purpose. And last year, which was probably, well, it was the biggest year since 2009 in a fire sense, uh, that line of control stood the test of time uh, extremely well, and now we just need to do some finer points. But the thing about the line of control, it was the mechanism to ensure we were broader than those that just have red and blue lights on their vehicles. It was the change to make sure education and health and all those other partner agencies were in there, including the media. Very important. We had agreements about emergency broadcasters, uh, but I think it was a one way we pushed to you. Uh, through the line of control and the mechanisms around it, uh, has been absolutely fundamental in the way in which we operate and contribute. Some examples, Melbourne Water, we, meet, uh, we met with Melbourne Water yesterday uh, morning at 7.30 and they were saying to us, thank you um, for allowing us to be a major contributor to the control strategies of the state. Now if you think about Melbourne Water, one of the biggest things that we need to protect uh, in the state is water catchments. Water catchments are very particular uh, very focused and um, under my under my leadership, I do not want to burn the water catchments out at all. Uh, I don't want to see the water catchments um, black in any way. It has a huge impact and there's people in the room that understand the water industry better than I. It will have a huge back impact on all Victorians, particularly those that live in the metropolitan basin, uh, about water quality and uh, what the yield is. And it will be very expensive. Uh, so from those sort of things, you talk about our control priorities and that third one we're talking about critical infrastructure and community assets. All of a sudden those partnerships are really important. They've had strong partnerships with DSE previously, but this year we took Melbourne Water right inside to make sure that they were connected all the way to the strategy. And uh, from their CEO right through to the person that's on the back of the fire truck, um, the Melbourne Water fire trucks out of Hillsville or anywhere else, um, we have actually um, brought them in uh, better. That's only one example, and uh, it can go on with Parks Victoria and others. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is there's been some risk-taking in the last number of years, but um, the risks, I think, were calculated, understood, and we were able to put structures in place collectively to ensure we're in a better place. Now, from that, the next, uh, the next period of time is interesting. Um, we've got a reform program that's under my legislation, called the Fire Services Reform Program. Um, the first year of that, and Mick's here, Mick, sits as a, Mick Burke sits as a key player in that. Um, the first year I think we were trying to work out what change really was. The second year we, we scoped it and understood a little bit about it. We've actually now started to really see some change in the sector. And uh, for example, um, our, our IT systems, our, our, the way in which we connect across, across multiple agencies, have always been agency-bound. 
that is. CFA has theirs, MFB has theirs, SES has theirs. Some of it's been a little bit connected. But we've never had a, a true strategy. It's been an opportunity, not a, not a strategy approach to do that. We've now developed um, what we call VINE, the Victorian Information Network for Emergencies. It's been developed in a blueprint. It's been developed in the architecture of how we want to operate. And it's all about mobile devices, cloud computing, uh, standards around uh, the way we'll operate. It's, it's moved into a, a new direction. Now, you might think it's strange I comment about that, um, but traditionally, we have invested as agencies, and that's been the accepted way. Traditionally, um, in the main, the agencies have not been at the front of technology, they've been at the middle or back of technology. That is, technology has run, and then it's been implemented in this sector. So, anyone that understands um, from a um, from a volunteer point of view, uh, in another life, they may be uh, corporate people in a business and they volunteer in their own community and they'd be saying, you know, you're pretty well back to pages and radio technology and the world's moved a long way on. Where are you as an industry? So we've taken time to build that and it's been a little bit um, difficult to build in the sense that someone's always got a bright idea, someone's always seen something new to do and there's a tendency to keep investing. So it's a little bit about how do we actually um, manage this to get the best outcome from an investment point of view? Not easy. Uh, it's interesting though, we've had Vine, the Victorian Information Network for Emergencies overseas. So we took it to the States and, uh, and not over, uh, overselling it, but we're testing with uh, Department of Homeland Security in Washington, Fire Department New York, New York Office of Emergency Management. Uh, Homeland Security invested a huge amount of money after 9-11 into decision making. So uh, Massachusetts Institute at Boston, um, one of the best uh, labs that we would see about uh, understanding the decision making process. So not just about an IT system, but what do you need to put in front of people in the ways you put in front of them to make good decisions. And that's, that's the key to our systems. How do we get our into controllers to make good decisions and how do we actually give information to the community to allow them to make good decisions about their safety in a fire, a flood, a rescue, whatever it is. Really important. And uh, MIT have done a huge amount of work um, under the leadership of the uh, American government. Uh, and then we went to Cal Fire, California Fire, who is the uh, overarching fire department for California. But California, bigger and better than most, have to have, um, and the, the way in which the, uh, the states operate, underneath their banner is 54 fire departments, and uh, some of those fire departments are huge. So LA City, LA County, LA City in, its, in itself is uh, you know, protecting something, I think, about 18 million people. LA County protects, I think, 12 million people. So they're big fire departments. Uh, and uh, I was there in their summer, and they were using what we call a new incident management system. So new generation incident command system is what they're using, uh, built on the same principles of what Vine was. So our Vine about standards, about mobile devices, about um, cloud computing, they built something similar. Interesting enough, we're now using that as a test bed and look to actually bring that into Victoria, hopefully, in the next 12 months. Now that's a, that's a big call, uh, but that's our aim, is to look at something that we will bring into the state as our single view of incident of the future. So Vine has got reality around it. Interesting, and I'm now being a bold, and some might say um, other words, um, starts with sm smart, and a little word on the back, um, that Vine was said to us, you know, you've got the framework for the, what, the world network. So Vine, they saw as wine, and the Americans actually are very keen to use what we've built. Hence, yesterday, the 19th, I think it's yesterday or the day before, the 19th of November in New York, uh, that was presented as a front and centre piece by Homeland Security, Melbourne University, IBM Research Lab, which is in Carlton. And unfortunately, we weren't able to talk about it, but that was the front and centre of a whole um, symposium in New York only two days ago. Uh, so Vine was sitting front and centre, but the whole reform program that's running in Victoria is now being seen on the other side of the world as something that's fundamental. And interesting enough, and this is when I say we're a little bit bold about this, uh, we've actually got something that others are watching with interest and Victoria is a very important part now of the emergency management world, the global world. That um, I don't think any of us started to want to do that, but it's interesting how it's evolved that we are now the centrepiece of many things, which is very important. And probably the most important part of that is where we're going. Um, for many years, and if I take you back 15 years, our agencies worked as single agencies. So CFA was a very proud organisation. I spent 25 years of my life there. 
and an organisation that is actually um, extremely special. MFB, likewise, a boutique, and I say that nicely, uh, fire service looks after a small footprint, um, but actually has a, a, a great brand, MFB. And likewise with DEPI, in a forest firefighting sense, is seen in the Canadian and American, the Northern American world, as some of the best forest firefighters we could have anywhere in the world. And it's interesting when they, those forest fire uh, agencies from across the other side of the globe look at us, they always come to Victoria um, in preference to other states. And that's because we have actually spent a huge amount of time over many decades to build a forest firing capability that others haven't got but would love to have. That's all great, all big ticks. The next step though, the white paper the government have put on the table is that we in the emergency services is about to move to the next step. And it's an important step and it's a fundamental step. So if you think about independent, uh, ind individual agencies operating 15 years ago, the last five years have been about the emergency service organisations. Those who've got red and blue lights to work together a lot better, um, join them in systems, in approach, in style, in connection. And that's obviously um, one of my key responsibilities. The next step though is the move to emergency management. Emergency services to emergency management. And it's not it's not transferring some names. It's a fundamental step that is so significant for Victoria, uh, but we will, we will lead not only Australia, but the world in this step. And when I say that, it now takes us to where um, the planning, the, the risk, the resilience, the capability, the response, the relief, the recovery, the regeneration, the reinstatement, all of those R words that are downstream normally in what we do under recovery are going to be put under one banner. And the Emergency Management Act of 2013 is drafted and gone through the lower house. And you can only hope that uh, next week that Parliament sits in a sensible way to actually continue the discussion in the upper house. This piece of legislation is really important and sets the direction now that emergency management is no longer um, owned by those traditional emergency service organisations. It's across government and across all of our partner agencies. It moves into things that uh, I won't get into detail this morning here, but it moves to a consequence approach. I, again, probably quite bold in saying this, believe we're the only ones in the world leading this. It's been led in some areas in terrorism, but not in mainstream emergency management, about focused on consequence, not the incident itself. Have to manage the incident, but the consequences is what drives the decision making. And there are many examples of how we have been judged by media, government and communities previously about those issues. As simple as road, um, road management, traffic management, where we've locked things up for three weeks at a time um, because there's smoke in the area and all of a sudden the consequences on local communities are absolutely um, fundamental to their survivability. Uh, I could use Harrietville this year as that. Harrietville, we ended up having a, uh, a request by a minister to do an investigation my opinion of Harriet Villa was nothing to do with the smoke in the sky, it all had to do with economics, because the town was isolated. The town, the, the, the person that owns the coffee shop had roadblocks in for three weeks and our messaging was, um, you can't go past Bright, so on and so on. What happened to that town? If you're the person that owns the coffee shop and you rely on selling 30 cups of coffee every three days and you sell zero, the bank manager after a couple of weeks asks about your cash flow and you'll start considering where you are. So this whole issue about consequence that takes in the global understanding of what we're doing, uh, the economics, the environment, the social impacts is critical for us to do. And I think we've done um, quite well in that space over the last number of years to move to there. So it's about not, not just the emergency, not just the impact of the emergency, it's about the consequence of the emergency. Tourism Victoria, um, Natalie's here with me today, and uh, Natalie spends a lot of time um, dealing with Tourism Victoria, where when I started this job, they were angry with us. Seriously angry with us. Angry with the Chief of DSC about planned burning, angry with us about our messaging, and we actually stopped one of the adverts the first year I was in, on the 11th hour, and changed the words in the ad, the TV ad, based on what tourism were putting to us. Because we were scaring Victorians and using language that, that was not conducive to a good outcome for tourism. But we can't compromise what is community safety as well, so we need to get the balance. So in those sort of things, I think we've moved to a more mature discussion and we'll continue to do so to make sure that it is focused on consequence and this new Act of Parliament is very much, um, it actually spends a whole uh, section about consequence management in emergency management. 
Um, from that, uh, I think that, uh, and I won't go, uh, there's much more you could talk about um, in absolute detail about the journey we're, we've been on, but more importantly, the journey we're about to embark. Uh, interesting enough, for, uh, for what is the new legislation, just quickly, it'll form what they call Emergency Management Victoria as, a, as an organisation that live in the Department of Justice. There will be an Emergency Management Commissioner, which will replace the Fire Service Commissioner, so my job disappears and is replaced by an Emergency Management Commissioner. Um, which I've been uh, indicated by Parliament that uh, I'll fulfil that. Uh, they'll also have a Chief Executive of Emergency Management Victoria to run the business side of uh, EM, and that's really important to give the overarching support to the CEOs of the agencies and the, uh, the Dep Secretaries in the departments that have responsibilities. Uh, there's a new council put in place that is chaired by the Secretary of DPC, so Premier and Cabinet, and each of the Secretaries of Departments sit at that table. Now, that might be easy to say, and you go, oh, another committee or a council. Really fundamental. This is the fundamental thing that says it's everyone's responsibility to lead emergency management in the state of Victoria, and not mine, and not Mick Burke's, or Ewan Ferguson's, or Shane Wright. It's all of the department's responsibilities, and uh, it's expected that each of the secretaries actually are in the room to have that discussion. So whether it's an education issue, education is absolutely critical to us, in not only the protection and, uh, and duty of care to children in fire, but the messaging, education and the infrastructure they operate. Likewise with health, transport, planning, it goes on. And just in the fire footprint alone, without going to the broader emergencies, uh, it is complex. Think about the things that sit on the table today, and those that are in the media will know this. Plan burning often comes up as uh, how much do we achieve, is it the right numbers, where does it go? Um, land use planning, where we live, the building arrangements of how we operate, the bushfire management overlay, 98% um, that have, have, have uh, applied for planning permits have actually had them approved. 2% are either in a process of VCAT or somewhere else. But it's interesting that 2% shouldn't be underestimated. That's a small figure. It's still quite a large number of people that have problems building uh, in what is the new um, building arrangements of the state. It goes on to uh, information systems. We will be judged, rightly so, by the community, the media and government on the way in which we put new information systems in to push information out, which I'll talk about in a moment, because uh, we do have some new things there that we release soon. Uh, and it goes into uh, things like community refuges, it goes into things like complacency in communities. So those issues, just in a fire footprint, that we've already had a chat at the council about, uh, if you think of the things I just named, I can't fix those. I can bring them to the council and talk to them about it, but if it's a land use planning issue, it's the Secretary of Planning. If it's a plan burning issue, it's the Secretary of Deputy. In public land, that is, let alone what we do in private land in, in, um, in hazard reduction. Uh, and it goes on. So you can see, I think what I'm describing you, EM is no longer those that have got red and blue lights on their, on their vehicles at all. EM now is across government, uh, in partnerships with government, uh, goes into business and reaches right into our corporate partners such as the telcos, Telstra and others are critical to what we do. The water agencies, the power agencies, power lines in itself comes up in the Royal Commission as a key issue. Significant work being done in power. I spend um, a fair amount of my time in the power industry um, working with them to understand risk and appropriate interventions. So we live in a fire world, pretty complex, take on all those other emergencies and it tells you we're in a, 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 a good space, a new space and a space that's right to be there. All right, now I might go to the season. Now I've got this strategy that I talk as long as I can in, <coughs> to make sure we minimise questions because Darren's writing lots of questions there. No, no, not at all. Uh, the season. The season's an interesting season. Um, if, if you've ever heard me speak elsewhere, I'm not one to try and scare um, Victorians at all. I, I think that's the wrong strategy to go into the scare tactics of, of scaring and, uh, and being over, uh, overzealous in the fire world. However, this summer, the summer season, and that's important what I've just said, the summer season, it's not the bushfire season, it's not the grass fire season, it's the summer season. And what summer brings Victoria is the risk of fire. But it also brings other risks. If you're the Chief Health Officer, it brings heat. In some parts of the state, it will bring the frustration of dust. In other parts, it will bring the issue, because of heat, that it could be um, challenging the infrastructure, particularly the power infrastructure. So we shouldn't get lost that the, the only risk we face is bushfire. 
Bushfire is certainly a dominant um, factor, but again, like I said, we work as close with Rosemary Lister as the Chief Health Officer in everything we do, and I'd speak to Rosemary on a very regular basis, uh, and, uh, and Rosemary is an absolutely fantastic uh, Chief Health Officer, uh, about what are we doing in heat, because our messaging around heat or fire sometimes relate to each other. So that's really important about the summer season. This year, in a fire context, um, it's an interesting season. July, uh, the warmest July, I won't say on record, but for many years. August, a very short snow season. Four weeks in some cases. Uh, if you're in the snow industry, you would have been worried this year. That was, you know, the best you might have got out of it was five weeks. Uh, we've seen rain, we've seen warm weather, we've seen a connection across um, what is the spring season that's conducive to good growth in the grasslands and in particular the grasslands. If the Bureau were here and they painted the story of the last three years, and think about the last three years, we've had um, floods, we've had dry seasons, but the fact is that we still have not seen the soil dryness in some parts of the state go back to pre-drought conditions. In the western side of the state, central and western side, it is back in, in, in soil dryness to around about 2006, which was mid the drought. Now think, think about what that means. If I would talk about the derail fire, which was I think the 27th of March or 28th of March at the end of our fire season, uh, very aggressive fire. Intensity was of significance. Lost houses, did not lose lives, people moved away from the fire and I think that is the lucky bit. They moved away from the fire. They actually moved. It was a day that was uh, that spiked and on for two hours we believe it reached a, in a forest fire danger index well over 100 which means it was in the code red category of fire danger ratings. But the forecast showed it was sitting below that. But it spiked for a couple of hours and had a very intense firefight. That area hasn't really changed. If you go down there now, it's green, the dams are full, there's probably a bit of water sitting around, um, but it hasn't had the saturating rains to see that country change dramatically. So it is back in that 2000s soil moisture content. And that's consistent across the west of the state and central Victoria. Uh, I was at Erica the other day with Melbourne Water at the, the Thompson, Thompson Dam and three cars driving around in the paddocks up and down tracks and I was amazed only after 24 hours of rain that here's all this dust lifting off the road. Now I don't drive out the bush very often, I'm not really good at it, but, um, no I do actually. Uh, it, it's interesting when you drive around to what is the dryness in those areas, so the surface dryness is there too, so really, really important in that sense. So from that, if you take that through to say spring, what spring's offered to us, grass is out there, um, grass is standing up quite high. Once it dries, that's the fuel. You know this, so I'm giving you the 101 of fire now. Uh, and that's a critical factor. So we haven't got a grass fire season, and we haven't got a bush fire season, we've got both. It's going to be there. The, 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 the parts of the bush will dry. Some of, the, some of the hungry bush we've got go into central Victoria where it's old gold, gold mining country, it's hungry bush. It will dry and dry rather quick. The other factor that I watch is central Victoria. And anyone that understands the, 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 the cycles of weather in, in Australia, it's already been hot in central Australia. Uh, it was very hot when it moved and had that impact on the Blue Mountains. That was actually a lot of very dry air masses moving into New South Wales. So central Victoria watch. Last year, that was the driving factor what changed our January. So, so that's there, and it's sitting up again to show that it's a very, very hot um, part of Australia that will impact on us in the eastern seaboard. So that's there. Um, we shouldn't scare. Our preparedness is good. Agencies working together, all good. Aircraft is always up as an issue. Uh, aircraft, 41 aircraft, 24 of those are helicopters. The thing that runs in the media sometimes is the magical world, Elvis. Uh, Elvis is a, uh, an orange helicopter that's got the name Elvis written across the front. Funny enough, we'll have another orange one in the town sitting in Essendon this year. It just won't have Elvis written on the front. It'll have another name. Could be Ted, could be Dennis, could be Peter, could be Kim. No, that's a joke. Don't take that anywhere. <laughs> so it uh, could be Mick, could be Craig. It won't be. They've got names on them, and uh, we normally run two orange helicopters. The two orange helicopters are back. However, the one at Essendon for 
for those in the room, it's a slightly smaller in capacity. Instead of 9,000 litres, it's 7,500 litres, but it gives us a faster airspeed. So we've got a quicker across, quicker out, quicker to move across the sky with a little bit less water, but there's two of them the same. So the one at uh, Ballarat and one at Essendon are two orange helicopters, and I'm sure most people will say, there goes Elvis again, even though Elvis is not in town. Elvis is not coming back to Australia, it's actually working elsewhere. Um, so out of that, that's there, and then we run two other major helicopters at Colac and Mansfield, which are still there, out of the fleet of 24. So we are in a good spot with aircraft. Uh, Adam's the, the manager of the state aircraft unit, Adam's here, uh, and we, we work um, to make sure we have the best fleet in Australia, and it is. It is the best fleet in Australia, um, runs in Victoria. Uh, we have changed a couple of other things around in aircraft from those down the western districts. Uh, Ed would know this. Uh, at Caston and Hamilton now, um, we, we, uh, it's grassland areas uh, and we are running um, what we call twin machines beside each other. So instead of having one in Hamilton and Caston, we're running two in Hamilton and Caston. And, uh, that doesn't change the numbers, we're moving things around. And the aim for that is that we run them in pairs now. We don't run them as single things, so they go out um, as two machines working together and we get better uh, initial attack out of two machines. So that's a bit of a change, and we've done some work in Mount Gambier with South Australia. So out of that, we are in a really good position, but aircraft is one of those front and centre things the media will watch and don't always um, give us the opportunity to explain the detail. And that's, you know, it's very hard in a 30 second grab on the Channel 9 News to get the, the understanding of where we are, but we're in a really good spot. Um, probably two other things as I finish off, uh, and I've got a little video here that I'll, uh, I'll connect up in a moment. Um, new app, new Fire Ready app is in testing. Um, we're into detailed testing at the moment. Um, massive numbers being put through the test, so it's under load testing at the moment. Um, the last, uh, they're, they're aiming to get to uh, multiple million of hits and the ability to push out um, millions of uh, hits or, or messages, uh, push notifications in the app, and also a new website. And I won't, the little video will explain those, both those things in a moment, um, hopefully clearly. And the other focus is about the outer metropolitan area. Uh, Donnybrook fire of last year caused us a bit of grief, uh, a bit of concern in the sense that our messaging and our connection to those communities when they think about grasslands, and I think this is that issue about bushfire, everyone sees bush, bush is the issue of Victoria, uh, what happens when we, when we move into the issue of grass. Grass has a different intensity, but if you live against grassland and there is a significant amount of it, it will on you and your family, and particularly the amount of smoke it generates about the decisions you make. We had to change our messaging a bit about in those subdivisions, you don't actually have to drive out of the subdivision if you're in there, but if you move within the subdivision away from the interface area, uh, would be a better move, because we had a whole heap of road traffic congestion in those suburbs that caused all sorts of problems to us, including police and others. So there's been a little bit different messaging around out of Metro, I won't go into the full detail of it, but we've taken a great focus, particularly in the, in the municipalities that to the west and northern parts of Melbourne, um, and also very strongly connected to education about the school principals about what they'll do in February. School principals to me are an absolute fundamental part of the partnership. They are the trusted network, they are the trusted source. Stu um, parents and students trust the principal. So they're a very important network for us to get information. And if I was a principal and I was relying listening to 774 at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Sorry, it's not good enough for us to do that. We need direct, direct connection into these schools so they're getting timely information to make decisions about the school community and not relying on third layers of information about watching a website, which is good, um, listening to 774, as we've told everyone else to do, I think the, 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 the principals need a little bit more information earlier than that to make good decisions about all sorts of things. So, so working with education, they've welcomed that. And this is what I mean, this EM responsibility is bigger than us. So those in the outer metropolitan area, um, CFA, Parks, DEPI and MFB, have been very strong to engage and will continue to engage. But the focus will be for that area in February when the schools are back. So they've done some preliminary work in this term, but it'll be day one schools back, it'll be a very strong campaign focused at the school principal in those areas, and education will, will lead that. Um, probably just in closing, uh, our, our, our partnerships with rural, regional and metropolitan media is absolutely critical. So Ed, we welcome the opportunity, and uh, it's great to see that CFA and Depi are partners with you in that. Uh, our people do good things. We've got great volunteers, and as I said before, people look around the world to see what we've got. Our integrated services is something we should be very proud of, and we do extremely well. We put a banner up this year, very simple set of words, we work as one. 
Um, there'll be examples that sometimes you'll see that uh, Parks and Depi don't get on or Melbourne Water and, and, and Parks haven't got it right or CFA and MMP haven't got it right or CFA and SES haven't got it right, it doesn't matter which one. We're saying to our people in every instance, it's not good enough 9 out of 10, but in every instance we work as one from the initial attack. Now our arrangements allow, make us do that, but sometimes we don't get it right on the ground, but it's more likely to be the one percentile, not not the 90 percentile. But we've gone out very strong to say those simple four words, we work as one at every level and it's a fundamental start. And that is about that shared responsibility and shared obligation we've all got. It's not just the community, uh, it's not just us, it's all of us to do it together and to do it well and we will continue to do so.